What's up everybody, welcome to Axel's Analysis. I'm the man too cheap to make up his own name, so I've had to steal one, Axel Mulligan. Uh, we're up to episode 4 now. I'm reviewing this week's NXT TakeOver. And it was it was a real, sort of, they, they hit a home run with it. It was a fantastic show. Um, really good matches on the card, or bar one, which I'll get to shortly. But um, it wasn't quite as good as Arrival, but it was not far behind. Um, I really enjoyed the show, and anybody that I've spoken to has really enjoyed it as well. Everybody's got their sort of little gripes and groans about it, but there was nothing um, that sort of killed the show, which was good. You know, I mean, you, you get those kinds of things sometimes on pay-per-views where you get something that just sort of drains the show and it takes away like something special from it, but there was nothing like that on this show. It was There was one bad match and it didn't really kill the show for me. Um, Go on, my usual commentators talk to start the show. Uh, we had Tom Phillips, William Regal, and Byron Saxton. And for me, commentators' performances as a team generally goes very much. Um, it doesn't get talked about enough. And this performance by all three guys was absolutely brilliant. Um, you've got the insight of William Regal. You've got uh, Tom Phillips, who's probably he's he's one of the best play-by-play guys around. Um, I mean, if you're talking from sort of companies like Ring of Honor, TNA and WWE, um, everybody would probably say Michael Cole's the best. I would disagree. I would say Tom Phillips is better because he's actually got, he doesn't go off track with the matches, whereas Michael Cole just generally talk about any old kind of shit that's going on and it doesn't really relate to what's going on in the ring. Whereas Tom Phillips will talk about what's going on in the ring. You've got TNA, you've got Mike Tanay who just bores the fuck out of everybody. and um, Kevin Kelly and Ring of Honor, I've never been a big Kevin Kelly fan, but I can get away with listening to him with Steve Carino on collar commentary. So um, William Regal was brilliant throughout the show as well. You know, he's very, very insightful. He, he's obviously he's been there and done it all in the ring. And his opinions are one of the best things to listen to on NXT. Uh, and then you've got Byron Saxton, who sort of gets all the backstage gossip, like saying, well, I spoke to Tyson Kidd earlier and he said this, or I spoke to Adrian Neville earlier and he said that. And that's good because you don't really get that off of the off of the main roster these days. You used to get it years ago with guys like JR, uh, Michael Cole back when he was doing just SmackDown, but you don't really get that anymore. So I was quite... Byron Saxton always impresses me. He's somebody that doesn't get spoken about enough. The same with Tom Phillips. Everybody talks about William Regal in NXT, but nobody talks about uh, Phillips or Saxton. So, you know, fair play to them both. They're doing a really good job. What I'd like to see sometime, maybe not right now, but maybe in sort of six to 12 months, seeing Phillips and Saxton moved on to SmackDown. Um, because I think as a team, they work better than JBL and Michael Cole. Michael Cole and JBL worked really well together back in, I think it was 2006, when JBL initially retired. Um, Because JBL played that really good monster heel role, but um, now he's sort of, he's like, yeah, this guy's impressive, and he's talking about a babyface when he's supposed to be a heel. So, for me, heel commentators need to stay heel, babyface needs to stay babyface. Um, And heel commentators should never praise a babyface wrestler. as much as I don't mind babyface commentators praising heel wrestlers, I mean that's their job. They're sort of due to give credit where it's they give credit to where it's due. But heel commentators should just stay pro heel with the wrestling. Um, I say easily the best performance of 2014 by any commentary team, hands down. There's no doubt about that. This was phenomenal. So big big credit to uh, to all three guys. Um, doing a really good job there and hopefully you know as I say we'll see them moving on to the main roster sometime in the near future Um, the opening match of the night was Adam Rose versus Camacho Um, the entrance for Adam Rose was really good actually what he did was he was sort of started out in the car park with the Rosebuds Um, his music's going off they're all singing and dancing and they make their way into the NXT arena and it was really well done. It was really well pulled off. The crowd loved it. The crowd loves Adam Rose anyway. But when he can pull off, or when he can pull off, anybody can pull that off. When he when he does something special like that, it just makes it even more interesting and even more entertaining. So whoever came up with that idea, I thought was brilliant. So well done to them. Um, Camacho. A quick note on Camacho, actually. His father, I didn't realise his father was Haku. Um, apparently his father was in attendance that night. So, you know, so 
San Juarez, Mexico, fucking Samoa, obviously. Um, the match was short, but it was decent enough. Um, it reminded me of an old Sunday Night Heat or Velocity main event match where the babyface would get the initial um, advantage in the match, then fairly sh- like fairly soon into the match, the heel would take advantage, and then the face would get the late flurry towards the end and pick up the win. Um, and it was quite nostalgic for me. I, I enjoyed the match, and as I said, the baby face picked up the win. Uh, Adam Rose uh, with the sn- with his snapmare driver, which he calls Party Foul. Um, a good move. It kind of reminded me. Um, it's a bit like a, a, a cutter, I suppose, um, but more of a, a snapmare type rather than like say an RKO, which is obviously a cutter as well. So um, that was a decent little way to start the show, really. And obviously, Adam Rose's entrance was the big the big thing to start the show. So I quite liked that. That was a good little match. Um, segment two or match two was the Ascension versus Elo, Cal and Kalisto. And they're facing a proper team now. Why are they still fucking squashing them? They dominated Kalisto. Um, basically, the start of the match was they were, both teams were in the ring and the Ascension just basically started sort of charged them, kicked the shit out of them. Um, there wasn't very much early um, offense for El Local or Kalisto. Um, they got um, it, it lasted basically. The advantage lasted with the Ascension until uh, Kalisto got the hot tag to um, El Local. Um, he came in. He, he probably got about thirty seconds worth of offense in. Um, the Ascension won with the fall of man. Um, why, why are they creating new teams just to get them squashed? I don't understand that. Um, I'd at least thought, I knew, I, I had the thought that the Ascension would win, but why not have it so the match so that Elo Cow and Kalisto could at least sort of make you think they might win, eh? Oh my god, he's gonna win. But they don't do that. They don't, they didn't do that, and it, it didn't really make much sense, as I said, to have this new team and get them squashed. It just didn't. The match did nothing for me. This was the one blemish on the night for me, and this is what bumped the, my overall rating of the show down. Um, match three, match of the night, no doubt about it. Everybody has said it. It was the match of the night. The star of NXT arrival, Sami Zayn, uh, versus Tyler Breeze. And something else I found out as well. I mentioned a couple of weeks ago when they did all these promos between Tyler Breeze, Sami Zayn, and Tyson Kidd. Tyler Breeze said that, um, the other two guys couldn't win because they're Canadian. Tyler Breeze is Canadian. I mean, obviously he's going to portray an American, but it, looking back at, after doing my research, it didn't really make much sense. But um, as I say, this was the match of the night. The highlight of the match for me was um, Sami Zayn did this. Uh, well, both guys were on the outside of the ring. Uh, Tyler Breeze was sort of down on the floor and uh, Sami was on the apron. And he springboarded off the top rope. Um, but when he came off of the top rope, he didn't go from his feet. He went from sort of the, the backs of his knees or his hamstrings. And he hit an Asai moonsault onto uh, Tyler Breeze. Breeze sort of. One thing that could have made it a little bit more impressive, which what I thought he was going to do as soon as he made contact, was if he'd have sort of caught uh, Breeze sort of in his armpit and drove him into the uh, the ramp. It, it was brilliant for what it was, but that would have just made it like a little bit more special for me. I thought it was a fantastic manoeuvre, um, but that would have made it a little bit more impressive for me. Um, but as I say, that was the highlight of the match for me. Um, the ending was really good as well. Um, Sammy had a uh, breeze in the corner. He ran at him to do the huluva kick, or to hit him with the huluva kick. And um, Tyler Breeze being Prince Pretty got his hands up to protect his face or got his arms up rather to protect his face and as he did he caught um sammy in the balls with his uh, forearm and the referee kind of pissed me off really because he said to tyler breeze he goes did you do that on purpose did you low blow him well of course he's going to fucking say no it's a number one contenders match for their like their top championship in that part of the company of course he's going to fucking say no what a stupid question um just after that sort of sammy Zayn went down like a sack of shit basically uh, Breeze got up, hit him with a beauty shot, and we got a new number one contender. And it was, if you've not seen Takeover, and I urge anybody who's not seen it, watch it. Go f- 
through any means necessary to watch it. Just even if it's just for this match, it was amazing. It really was. Um, both uh, both Sami Zayn and Tyler Breeze have got new entrance music. Sami came out first, and Sami had this like it was a ska punk kind of thing. I'm a big ska punk fan. Um, so it's it, yeah, even I like sort of came out with the right sort of walk or dance, if you what whatever you want to call it. It was really good. Um, and Tyler Breeze came out and he's now singing his own entrance music and the one thing that struck my mind first or came to my mind first when he came out and I heard Tyler Breeze's voice singing this music Shawn Michaels Shawn Michaels sang um, Sexy Boy I'm not too sure what Tyler Breeze's song is called but he sang it and it was all about him being you know as he calls himself gorgeous so a little comparison there between uh, Tyler Breeze and Shawn Michaels. You know, I don't know if anybody would turn around to me and say, how can you compare Tyler Breeze with Shawn Michaels? But I'm comparing their entrance music. So, you know, I thought that was really good. Um, so, yeah, Tyler Breeze is the new number one contender. As I say, if you haven't seen it, just just watch the show just for this match. It was phenomenal. It really was. Um, the next segment was uh, Lana came out. Uh, she was sort of introduced by... Um, Brandy Rhodes or uh, Eden, as they're calling her. Um, Lana came out to preach about how great Russia is and how far superior uh, Russia is to the United States. Uh, she brought Rusev out. They came to the ring. Uh, Rusev had a Russian flag with him. Um, they both basically talked shit on America. Russia pr praised, uh, sorry, Lana praised Russia and Vladimir Putin as you know what they've been doing on Raw and SmackDown recently. And you think, right, this time you want a real American patriot to come out, maybe like, I don't know, maybe not necessarily like a Hulk Hogan, or Hulk Hogan rather, uh, maybe like a Haxel Jim Duggan, you know, we had the segment with him a couple of weeks ago. Who do we fucking get? Mojo fucking Rawley. When the fuck has Mojo Rawley ever been patri a, a true patriot on screen to America? He comes out waving his American flag. And one thing that did make me laugh at is he turned around to... Uh, Rusev, he said, I'm going to come down to the ring and I'm going to stick that flag up your Putin. Obviously, he's going to stick it in his ass. Well, he didn't. He got his ass kicked. He ran into the ring and as soon as he made it to his feet, after he sort of slid into the ring, as soon as he made it up to his feet, bam, he got hit in the jaw with a super kick. Don't write checks you can't cash, basically. He got the ever-loving shit kicked out of him. I think he got put in the accolade about three or four times as well. And I was there sitting all along just sort of Yes, somebody's finally kicked the shit out of Mojo Rawley because I can't stand the bloke. Sure, he's a nice person, but as a wrestler, no, he, no, he's not a wrestler. As I said before, he's a football player. Get back on the fucking football field. Get out of the wrestling ring. But he got the shit kicked out of him, so that was uh, one of the highlights of the night for me. Um, the next match of the night was uh, the final of the women's championship tournament between uh, Charlotte and Natalia, and this was probably, I said on when I was writing my blogs a few months back, there was a match between uh, Paige and Natalia. And I said that was the best match that I'd seen from the women's division since Lita and Trish at uh, the 2006 Unforgiven pay-per-view. This match topped both of those. This was a fantastic match. Um, talking to a few people about it on Twitter last night after I watched um, TakeOver. and. Nobody could disagree with me. As much as some people turn around and say one of the other is overrated, this match won. This this match got Charlotte over for me as a fan. I mean, as I've said before, I'm not keen on her as a wrestler, but that's all blown out of the water now. This she wrestled a fantastic match. It's very very technical, very mat based, very you know lots of submissions, lots of groundwork. Fantastic match. It really was. Um, you had uh, Ric Flair in uh, Charlotte's corner. And even though they said he wasn't going to be there, you had Bret Hart in Natalia's corner. Now, the one thing that gets me with Bret Hart, I, I, I must admit, I still do get goosebumps watching Bret Hart on the WWE uh, product when he's on there. But if he's going to be in somebody's corner, I think he just needs a bit of charisma. I mean, he's never had charisma as such. Um, but he just needs some sort of charisma there because... You got Flair there. He's throwing his jacket around and he's strutting and he's wooing and 
and then you've got Bret Hart just stood there banging the ring when they're, when the fans are trying to get behind Italia. I mean, it, Bret Hart would never make a manager role. Um, as much as it's good to see him out there for these sort of, these odd sort of special occasions, you would never make a manager. Whereas Ric Flair, I think, would make a phenomenal manager. Um, but, you know, as I said, it was for only, it was only for one match, so, and I, I, I'm a big Bret Hart fan. What can I say? You know, anybody who watched any form of, or any, anyone who's watched a Bret Hart match from sort of the mid to late eighties to the late nineties, you know, everybody would be a Bret Hart fan. One of the best technical wrestlers has ever been. So, um, that was just a little observation that I had really. Um, as I said, it was a brilliant match. Um, Natalia, um, she was as good as she always is. She she didn't carry the match though, which was the good thing. Charlotte put her share of work in. Um, whereas I was thinking, how much of this match is Natalia going to carry? Because she, as I said before, I think in my opinion, she is the best female wrestler on the roster. Um, but no, she 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 didn't do all the work, which was good. She didn't carry Charlotte whatsoever. She really worked her ass off. Charlotte did so. I'm I'm impressed, and as I say, she's won me over as a fan. Um, she won the match with the with the bow down to the queen, the you know the uh, the somersault cutter that she uses. Um, still not keen on it as a finisher, but you know it's it's good good enough for now for me really. Um, after the match, she went a bit baby face. Um, she sort of celebrated with uh, Natalia, um, like sort of Natalia congratulated her, raised her hand, you know, congratulations kind of thing. Lots of hugs between. Uh, the four people that were involved in the match. Um, but she got a good reaction as well from the crowd, like a, a, a quite a strong baby face reaction. So maybe we'll see her turning face in the near future. And maybe, as I said before, I can see a few between her and Sasha Banks. Um, so maybe we'll see Sasha stay in Hill. But I think, um, I think if that feud does happen, it will, it will be a very entertaining feud, not just in the ring, but like sort of backstage promos and things like that as well. Um, one other note: she dedicated the the win, her title win, to Reed Flair, her brother who passed away. I think it was last year. Um, so yeah, you know, nice little touch there from Charlotte to her brother. Um, On to the main event, uh, which was for the NXT Championship between Tyson Kidd and Adrian Neville. Um, and this was a fantastic match as well, you know. Talk about that being the match to get uh, Charlotte over. This could have been the match and probably is the match to get uh, Tyson Kidd over. He wrestled a fantastic match. Um, the crowd wasn't really into it until maybe the last two or three minutes, which was a bit of a shame, really, because it was... If you were to watch it on mute, no commentary, no um, no crowd sound, this would have been... You you wouldn't have known that the crowd were sat on their hands for most of the match. This was a fantastic match. I thought worked very well. Two very very similar guys in the ring. Um, you've got Tyson Kidd, who probably is the complete wrestler. Really, he can brawl, he can fly, he can fight. He's a good submission uh, wrestler. He's a good technical wrestler. And you've got Adrian Neville, who's a very good high flyer, probably one of the best in the WWE at the moment. Um, he's a good technical wrestler. You know, he's not. He's not as big a submission specialist as Tyson Kidd, but, you know, he can use those submission moves. Um, the highlight of this match, and I thought this, this is going to sound a bit like, how's that your highlight of the match? But for me, this, I've got a reason for it and I'll explain it to you. Um, Tyson was down on the canvas. Uh, Neville ran to the ropes sort of on the, uh, the entrance ramp side of the ring. He ran to the ropes and as he hit the ropes, Tyson had followed him and, uh, Tyson jumped on the rope as well and he had a side rushing leg sweep sort of off the middle rope. And what the impressive thing was is that requires incredible balance. Not only that, the amount of sweat that gets sort of on those ropes throughout the matches, both men could have easily have slipped. So that was really impressive for me. It's a side rushing leg sweep as a, like a basic move, but I thought that was quite impressive that, you know, they both had the balance and the fact that, you know, they both had the awareness to sort of not botched the move. I thought it was really good. Um, end of the match came. Tyson went uh, up to the top rope looking to hit the blockbuster. That was the uh, the net breaker move that I was saying about a couple of weeks ago. Um, 
Neville got back up to his feet. He was on the ground. He got back up to his feet and he sort of jumped up onto the top rope, hit Hurricane Rana. Um, Tyson went right to the opposite side of the ring, like right to the opposite corner. Uh, Neville came off and he hit the uh, red arrow for the win. And the amount of times they show the red arrow, and they are right in what they say. You can never get tired of seeing that move. It is a fantastic, it's a beautiful move. It really is. You know, I don't really say that much about wrestling moves, but that really is, that is a thing of beauty. I mean, you won't see anything executed much better than that. Um, the one thing I was um, quite happy with during the match is that Tyson used the dungeon lock. Um, he used the, uh, the sharpshooter for know, maybe 10 seconds or so and never sort of wriggled out of it but he did manage to lock in the dungeon lock as well and I think maybe what was happening with that was I said a few weeks ago that he should be using that more often but I think maybe he was using waiting for the right moment to start using it again um it's all about timing obviously in wrestling if you can time things correctly it's like Sami Zayn with the um the DDT that he hit to Cesaro um in their two out of three falls match where he sort of ran through uh sorry he dived through the the ropes on the outside of the ring like sort of went across the corner and he hit the DDT and I've just finished watching Chris Hero's shoot um, interview that he did with uh, RF videos um, he, he recorded it about eight days after his release from WWE and he said that he was watching that match in the back with Paul Heyman and they were just sort of talking sort of like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and as he hit that move Paul Heyman's jaw just dropped and his eyes were just fixated on the match after that and that that's what I mean. It's all about timing. Sammy Zayn waited for that right moment to start using that move in the WWE. And I think maybe Tyson Kidd started using this move at the right moment again in the WWE. So I think that was the right moment to start using it again, um, in spite of what I said um, a couple of weeks ago. So, you know, well done, Tyson Kidd. I thought that was a you know really good uh, way to start using the move again. As I say, Neville uh, retained the championship. His, obviously, his new number one contender is Tyler Breeze. So obviously begs the question, when is Breeze going to have his championship match? Will it be in the next sort of three or four weeks? Or or what? Will, will we wait till the next set of tapings? There was a set of tapings last night at full sale. Um, I'm not sure if he used his title shot then or if he awaited wait till the next set. Or maybe um, it was announced uh, on the post show or the fallout show that we'll have another NXT live event either in the end at the end of the summer or at the beginning of the autumn. So maybe we'll see it then. Um, and that gives it a nice, like a nice little time to build it then, sort of two or three months. Um, kind of like with the Royal Rumble winner, I suppose, really. You know, we'll get sort of two or three months in between um, the championship match, sorry, the Royal Rumble match and the and the WrestleMania main event. So maybe we'll get a nice little build from that. Um, my overall rating of the show, I've given it an 8.5 because, as I said, they really did hit a home run. With the, sh- with the entire show, aside from the tag team title match, which should have been much more evenly contested than what it was, in my opinion. I know that they're trying to obviously build up the Ascension as this big dominant force, maybe looking to get them on the main roster and getting the idea in people's minds that they are a dominant force beforehand. But you, j- you just buried El Cal and Kalisto right there. Um, it didn't, didn't work for me. It didn't work for a lot of people. So that was the one mistake of the show for me. Um, the question, there's a lot of questions that are sort of left though after the, after the show. Um, Adam Rose is more than likely to be done with NXT now that he's on the main roster. So where does this leave Camacho? Um, you know, he's the one who started this feud, but he's not got anything to go on to now, whereas Adam Rose has got the main roster to go to. Where does Camacho go? Does he stay down in NXT? Does he move back up to the main roster? What do they do with him? They need to give him something to, keep him in people's minds. You know, he's a good worker, as I've said before. I'm a big fan of Camacho, and I'd like to see him used more often. Um, but where he goes, I'm not sure. Um, I'd like to see him used more regularly. Um, as I said, who's going to who's going to beat the Ascension? Uh, they're, they've squashed a brand new tag team. You know, it's a, a babyface tag team. We haven't got another babyface tag team, have we? Um, Ty Dillinger and Jason Jordan, actually, I tell you, I think they're a babyface team. But I can't see them beating them because they've had one match together. But then again, Kalisto and Aldo Caldo they had one match together before this show. So they need something to strengthen the division. As much as they, they're creating more teams, they need to make the matches that the Ascension are having more competitive. Um, if they can do that, um, 
make it more think, as I said earlier, oh, these guys could beat them. They could beat them. But nah, this, this didn't really do that for me in this match. It was, nah, it was nothing. Um, as I said as well, when will Tyler Breeze use his title match? Will he use it in the next sort of three or four weeks? Will he wait till the next live event? You know, just basically reading off the notes that I've written here. Um, again, as I said, will we get the uh, Charlotte versus Sasha feud that I, I personally love to see because I like, I've, as I said before, I've always been big on Sasha Banks in the ring and Charlotte, this match that she had just won me over. Um, lastly, Tyson Kidd, he sort of teased a hill turn at the end of the match. Um, Neville sort of done his post-match celebrations and Kidd was sort of making his way back to his feet in the corner of the ring. Uh, Neville went over to him to shake his hand and he just sort of barged into him and walked on off up the ramp. So is that a Tyson Kidd heel turn or is that a new attitude that he's taking on or, or what? It's, I, I'm looking forward to see where they go with that. I'm a big Tyson Kidd fan. I like all the, I, I'm a big fan of technical wrestling. I'm a big fan of Tyson Kidd. He's one of the best that they've got. So I'm interested to see where he, um, where he goes. And I think that if he does turn heel, you need new entrance music. As much as that might be like a minor detail, his, very, his entrance music that he's got now is very baby face. He needs something more heel to uh, get him over as a heel, I think. So, um, and I, I do like his entrance theme, as it is, which would be a shame if he did turn heel and change it. Um, and again, w- will he get a rematch at all? That's the other question. Um, generally, you don't see it where the challenger loses the match and you get a rematch, unless there's some sort of pre-match stipulation that he would get it. You don't get that very often, so um, I'd like to see a rematch because this match was brilliant. I loved it, every second of it. Um, but we'll see We'll see where they go with it um, in the next sort of month or two. Um, the news for the week, as I said, they'll be having the, uh, the next event either at the end of the summer or the beginning of the autumn. That was announced by Triple H on the Fallout show. Um, there haven't been any sort of names for the show floating around or anything yet, but I'm sure they'll come up with something, you know, like Arrival and Takeover work perfectly. So I'm sure they'll think of something else to uh, fit into that sort of that sort of that sort of scale of uh, name for the show, a name for the show. Um, and they're also looking to do uh, one of these live events every quarterly, so sort of every three or four months. Well, every three months would be every quarterly. So. Um, no, I'm looking forward to it. As I said, I'm a big... I've never missed a show of NXT since it became a developmental territory. So I'm looking forward to see what they do at the next uh, live event to see how they're going to play it out. I'm, I'm a big mark for NXT. Um, so, yeah, let's you know wait and see what they do with that. Um, apparently, the entire roster, and this is all I've read, is the entire roster, whether that's the entire WWE roster or the NXT roster or... NXT and WWE roster were backstage. They were sort of in an auditorium um, watching the show on a big screen. And I think that's a good move, especially if it is the entire WWE roster, because that brings both halves of the company together. Instead of having it as two halves, you've got the whole company there as a whole. And I thought that was a really good idea. Whoever's done that, if that if that is the entire company, NXT and WWE, if that is all them together, that's a brilliant move, I think. Um I mean, you get guys like Randy Orton. You've never seen Randy Orton on NXT. Or uh, Alberto Del Rio. I don't think he's been on NXT since it became the developmental territory. Uh, as much as you see, I think John Cena had a show um, a couple of years ago. Um, Daniel Bryan. Um, I don't think he's been on the show, but I'm not sure where he would have been there, obviously, with his neck injury. Um, you know, the big players, you don't generally see the big players down in NXT, but this is a good move. If that, to get the whole company together as well, I think. I like that. That's a good good way to do things. Um, there was a dark match before the show, actually, as well. Um, Bailey versus Sasha Banks. Bailey won, apparently, with the Bailey to Belly uh, suplex. Um, just obviously something before the show to get the fans sort of hyped up for it, I suppose. Um, Non-takeover news. We've had... Uh, I, I mentioned a couple of weeks ago about Kevin Steen uh, apparently coming to the WWE. Um... Word on the street, as they say, is that him and Willie Mack, um, they have to have a background check. I'm not sure what a background check is. Um, they have to have a background check. And once they've had that and, you know, should they pass that, they'll then have their medicals. And should they get through both of those, then 
then they'll be offered um, contracts with the WWE. So, um, as I said last week, I've recently got back into Ring of Honor, and I'm a big Kevin Steen fan. So it'd be sad, I'd be sad to see him leave Ring of Honor because he is, a, you know, he's a staple in the company. But um, obviously, if you're moving on to WWE, you're only, only moving on to better things, really. Um, and Willie Mack, I, I can honestly say now, I don't, I've heard of the name, but I've never seen any of his stuff, so I can't really comment on um, what he's all about in the ring. Um, also, Kent and Prince Devitt are expected to be in Orlando by the end of August um, to sign for the WWE. The only issues that they'd have would be right, their working visas, uh, medicals, etc., or any sort of you know other little problems that might occur. But they're expected to sign by the end of August. Um, this is just dirt sheet rumours that I'm reading here, mind. Um, and the last bit of news is that Christian, uh, he was actually shown on TV, well, on TV, on the show, on TakeOver with um, Cesaro before the main event, um, sort of in the front row of the crowd. And what WWE are thinking of doing is, because obviously they don't know when he's going to be able to return to the ring on a full-time basis, if at all. Obviously, with his, uh, he's had two concussions this year. But what they're talking about doing is having him in an agent or producer type of role, which I think is a good move because Christian is a fantastic, he's got a fantastic brain for the business. Um, really good move because he can offer so much to the younger talents, especially as well if he's working down at the performance center, helping to train these young guys in NXT. You know, Christian's a wily veteran. You know, he can teach you a lot of things. So. If he does, when his sort of uh, wrestling contract expires, if he does take on that agent or producer role, I think that's a good move to keep him involved in the company. Um, but there's a lot of people who can't see him being it, like wrestling for the WWE again, which is a shame because I'm a big Christian fan. You know, he wrestled on a show that got me into wrestling, which was uh, SummerSlam 2000, and the TLC match that he had that night. Uh, the tag, the three-way tag team TLC match. That was that was one of the two matches that night that got me into wrestling. Mainly, it was Chris Jericho versus Chris Benoit. But when you saw the entertainment of that TLC match, especially like the Hardys flying all over the place, edging Christian with their chairs, the Dudleys with the tables, you know that was a, that was a great time to start getting into wrestling. And Christian was one of those guys who helped helped me get into wrestling. So it'd be a shame if he does retire. Um, for me on a personal level and I know for a lot of other people who like Christian as a wrestler as well um, the birthdays for this week the wrestler or the former WWE stars birthdays um, on the 26th was uh, Ashley Mazzaro she was the 2000 I think it was 2006 Diva Search winner and I remember watching the very first show uh, or like with, the, with that particular Diva Search on and I saw Ashley Mazzaro and I thought she's going to win it and she won it um, also on the 26th, Natalia, sorry, Ashley turned 35, uh, Natalia turned 32, and I thought, I actually thought she was a few years younger, I thought she was probably like 27, 28, well, 28, 29 maybe, but, um, didn't think she was a sort of in her 30s to be honest, but apparently, well, obviously she is. Um, the 27th was, uh, Eric Bischoff, he turned 59. Um, obviously, everybody knows who Eric Bischoff is, former WCW president. He was the general manager on Raw. Did a lot of stuff behind the scenes after he lost his, or sort of inverted commas, lost his uh, job as general manager on Raw. Um, the 28th, Kamala turned 64. Everybody knows Kamala's gone through a few tough times in recent years, but um, now he turned 64 on the 28th. Brian Kendrick uh, turned 35. Um, quick note on Brian Kendrick. If anybody hasn't listened to last week's Sunday Segway uh, podcast, make sure you go back and listen to it. Kinney did a brilliant interview with Brian Kendrick, and I, I loved it. I thought Kinney did a brilliant job interviewing him, and he comes across as a really humble, sort of very um, appreciative guy of everything that he's earned in the business. Um, so if you haven't checked out that interview, check it out. As I say, he turned 35 on the 28th. And Seth Rollins turned uh, 28 as well. And I thought he was a couple of years older, actually. I talk about Natalia thinking she was younger. I thought Seth Rollins was a couple of years older. But he's, uh, as I say, he's turned 28. Uh, the 29th, uh, Pete Gass, former member of the Mean Street Posse. Everybody remembers the Mean Street Posse. He turned 44. 
Um, Steve Carina turned 41. And I, as, I'm not sure if Steve Carino ever worked for the WWE, but I know he worked for ECW. Um, but as I said earlier, he's, he's a fantastic, uh, color commentator. And I'd love to see him get signed up by the WWE if, uh, if and when his, well, sorry, when his Ring of Honor contract comes to an end and if he's willing to work for the WWE. So, um, yeah, he's a fantastic commentator. He's got such insight and I love, uh, the way he commentates when Matt Hardy's around, given that, oh my Hardy, as opposed to, oh my God. So, um, now, as I say, he turned 41 and Hornswoggle turned, uh, 28 as well on the 29th. Um, the 30th was the birthday of one of the newest members in the Hall of Fame, Jake Snake Roberts. Um, uh, somebody else who Kinney's interviewed as well, actually. Uh, he turned 59. Um, as well, I hope he's sort of recovering well from the cancer treatment that he had recently. Uh, I think that was just before WrestleMania weekend. So hopefully he's uh, sort of cancer free now and he's uh, able to move on. And the uh, 1st of June, another former ECW guy, Ian Rotten, he turned uh, 45. Um, anybody who's not seen the Tapai death match between him and Axel Rotten, really entertaining stuff. Um, sort of covering both their hands in, uh, sort of wrap the tape around their hands and basically cover them in glass and beat the shit out of each other. Fantastic match. I, I'm a mark for the old ECW stuff. I love it. Um, so yeah, if you have, if, again, kind of matches as where I always say, if you haven't seen them, watch them. You know, br- there's so many brilliant matches out there to be seen. And if you haven't seen them, they, you know, get on YouTube, Daily Motion, uh, Netflix, if they've got any of the old pay per views on there, uh, the Ring of Honor website, or if you can sort of I don't think anybody does it these days, but tape trade or DVD trade or whatever. Just lots of matches that need to be seen, really. Uh, this week in history, um, something that I, again, something I added a few weeks ago. Um, on the 26th of May, um, Goldust defeated The Undertaker in a casket match to retain the Intercontinental title. Um, that was at the first sort of taping, if you will. I use in very commas again of the In Your House 8 pay-per-view, um, Beware of the Dog. And that was in 1996. And I think I'm right in saying they had to retape it because there was a electrical fault with the light in it, the show. Um, and it was retaped again a couple of, a couple of days later and, uh, gold, gold dust retained again. Um, but yeah, in, uh, it was, I think it was the Undertaker's only, match or the only match that I can remember him having for the Intercontinental title. I mean as I said I've only been into wrestling since two thousand. This was nineteen ninety six, but I've gone back and watched a lot of the old stuff. So um I think that was his only match for the Intercontinental title and he would have been a triple crown winner and the Grand Slam winner had he won that match. Um the twenty seventh um R V D regained the IC title from Eddie Guerrero on Raw in two thousand two. That was a ladder match. And I think I'm right in saying that was the match where the fan jumped over the barricade and tried knocking one of them off the ladder. Um, but it was, again, it was a really entertaining match. And then RVD is my all time favorite wrestler. So it was, you know, it was a nice little moment for me as a fan for, you know, to sort of go back and relive that moment. Um, another raw moment was, uh, back in 2012, Daniel Bryan pinned CM Punk in a non-title match. Punk, it was during Punk's, um, 434 day title reign. And, uh, Daniel Bryan beat him. I think it was four, like, to become the number one contender again for the title. So I think the match went for about 15 or 20 minutes and it got a lot of praise online from guys like Bret Hart and Shawn Michaels. Um, and it was a match that hadn't been seen in the WWE until then, so it was obviously quite a big, uh, quite a big match. Um, the 31st, so uh, today, uh, back at what, well, sort of 15 years ago today, 1999, um, Farouk and Bradshaw, I believe they were the acolytes just before they became the APA, um, defeated Kane and X-Pac to become the World Tag Team Champions on Raw in 1999. And then the 1st of June, 2008, at the One Night Stand pay-per-view, Edge defeated The Undertaker to win the vacant World Heavyweight Championship. Uh, that was a TLC match, and the um, stipulation was beforehand that if Undertaker lost, he had to leave the WWE. Uh, as I say, he did lose, Edge defeated him. 
Um, but he was sort of rehired again a few months later by Vicky Guerrero, who was Edge's on-screen wife at the time, if you remember. And um, Undertaker ended up coming back for SummerSlam and defeating Edge in a Hell in a Cell match. Um, Edge had sort of lost the title by then. I'm not sure it was too nice, but um, no, it was, it was. I think I'm right in saying SummerSlam 2008 was the first uh, PG era pay per view. And um, the, that was the main event of the show, and uh, it was a way to write Edge off of TV for a few months. He wanted some time to recover. I recall him saying on his uh, DVD that they released after his retirement. Um, but yeah, that's the uh, this week in wrestling history. Um, the shout outs, uh, usual shout outs. You got Tim Vicious at Tim Vicious and at Tim underscore Vicious. Tim's raw reviews every week. I mean, me and him are doing each other a favor this week. Um, his YouTube show is called Vicious Rants, uh, which you can, as I say, you can find that on YouTube. Um, I didn't watch Raw this week, so I was relying on his show to fill me in with what happened. And he said to me that uh, he wasn't able to watch Takeover unless you've already seen it, Tim. I'm hoping like my show is helping you out with that. So, and if you haven't watched it, make sure you do. It's phenomenal. Um, so yeah, Tim's one of the most educated fans that I know. He's very um, passionate about the business. He's done a bit of backyard stuff himself, so he's sort of got a bit of bit more insight than what I've got to what goes on in the ring. Um, and he's just he's just a good guy to talk to. So make sure you look out for him on Twitter. Um, you've got the Sunday Segway podcast, which uh, they air on uh, iTunes, YouTube, Podomatic, and I, there are, I know there's a couple of other places, and I can never remember where they are, um, where their show goes up. Um, Kinney and Shug's every week, just fantastic. Laugh every Sunday afternoon. As I said, I said to Kinney the other day, you know, Sunday afternoons just wouldn't be the same without listening to the Sunday segue. Um, it's something that I've only been listening to for sort of four or five months now, but I absolutely love listening to it. Um, Kenny's working his well, he's trying his ass off to get me on the show. I will be on soon, Kenny. Just give me the shout and I'll be on for you, man. Um just had to sort out a few things, that was all. Um James Powers thirty three at James Powers thirty three. James is again he's he does raw reviews on uh YouTube. James's Wrestling Ramble, his show is called. Um James is another really well educated fan. He really knows his stuff. He's uh He's, he's another one. He's been trying to get me on his show as well, which I think I'm going to be on in a couple of weeks time. So make sure you listen to that. Um, I haven't listened to your show this week, James, but I will do. Um, once I finish recording this. Um, as I say, James is a really well educated fan. He knows what he's talking about with wrestling. He's very passionate about it. He's one of the most passionate fans that I know. He's a really good guy to talk to about wrestling as well. So make sure you give him a follow. Um, Pro Wrestling Smart Talk, that's at PW Smart Talk on Twitter. Um, Nick, as I've said before, he does a fantastic job. Uh, he's got his own sort of YouTube YouTube page, Facebook page, and, and Twitter page. He's got like a, a, a blogging site, which I used to send my NXT blogs into. And I've been trying to work out how to get my shows on there. Something's basically fucked up with my blogger account, uh, Nick. So unfortunately, I've not been able to post up there for a few weeks now. Um, but Nick's, as I said before, Nick has probably forgotten more than I'll ever know about wrestling. He's a very, very well educated fan. I mean, I talk about Tim, James, Kinney, and Shug's knowing their stuff. Nick's, he's a fucking walking encyclopedia on wrestling. He, he's interviewed so many guys and girls over the years as well. Um, just make sure you check out his, like, you find his interviews on his YouTube page that he's done. Um, some really good stuff. Uh, my favourite one that he's done was with uh, the Alpha Female. He did some work for TNA. That was a really good interview. And by the way, um, Kinney's interviewing her for this week's episode of the Sunday Segway. That's just reminded me now. So make sure you check that out as well. Um, and then the last one, as always, is WrestlingRambles.com. You can find them on Twitter at WrestlingRambles. That's spelt wrestling without the G. Um, another really good, they're, they're like a, a blogging website, really good. Um, community over there. They approached me a few months back now to write my top 15. I suggested to them I write my top 15 SmackDown moments to celebrate the 15th year of SmackDown. Um, and that went down really well, so I'm really appreciative of that. 
and I enjoy reading all the other blogs over there as well. So anybody who gets time to just check out, check them out, wrestlingrambles.com. Um, just even if you're just going over there just to read, you know, what the, what people are putting up on there. There's so many really good, um, entries over there. So many that I enjoy reading. As I said before, my favorite one is the three count. I absolutely love it. It's some really good, um, some really good write ups on there. So yeah, make sure you check that out. Um, and that's the end of the show. Thanks for listening. If you have, as I said before, if you've not seen Takeover, make sure you watch it because it really is. I, I sounded like a broken record, but it was a phenomenal show. I'd probably put it in, in, in amongst the top five shows of the year. Um, but yeah, as I said, if you've not watched it, you need to watch it. And, uh, thanks for listening to this show. <laughs>